Okay, uh, good day to you all and welcome to this uh, session of Friends of Multilateralism Group, FMG session on what I call soft power uh, of the dispute settlement uh, uh, mechanism of the WTO. Uh, before that, maybe a, a news about the FMG. So yesterday the board has approved uh, uh, three new members, uh, uh, so which is good news. And we have Fernando, who is here already with us. So congratulations, and uh, uh, of course, other uh, other than his expertise, we did say that uh, Fernando's participation will uh, seriously improve the uh, the 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 age scope of uh, FMG uh, together with some other senior friends. Uh, and then we have Tatiana and Nakatomi. So Tatiana is uh, uh, from Brazil, uh, and Nakatomi from Japan. So we have a new more kind of diversity in the group. So coming back to the session, uh, the soft power is something that uh, uh, Jonathan and Gabriela and some other uh, friends and members of our group, we discuss about uh, given the dire situation of the dispute settlement, especially the paralysis of the appellate body. How can we look at the mechanism through a different lens to see how we can use what we uh, say the kind of more good office mediation, arbitration and so on and so forth to help settle the disputes, which, of course, as Jonathan rightly pointed out in our discussion, that this kind of soft way to resolve disputes were actually in the center of the dispute settlement mechanism is itself vis-a-vis -vis the hard part about the kind of binding uh, ruling and the implementation, and if not, the retaliation. So that's why we think that this is an important aspect for us to look at, and we already have some good cases going on already the recent uh, uh, Turkey and uh, EU uh, arbitration case gave us a nice lens about how this could work and how the results could be and how to implement that. So without further ado, I will give floor uh, to Jean-Yves now who will be moderating this session and with a great panel. Thanks to you all and look forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, let me um, introduce myself. I'm, I'm Dr. Dani Rami, and I am a member of the FMG um, and a director at the Sridhar Ramphal Center. Thank you uh, so very much, Shun Kun, for it allowing me to be the or the moderator, modest role of moderating this very august panel. Um, I will introduce them shortly, but just by way of brief presentation of the topic. Uh, this topic of what has been termed soft power um, by the conveners of this session has seemed to be uh, taking on new wind um, at the WTO right now. I don't know if it is as a result uh, of the, the mandate in the outcome package, the outcome document, um, which doesn't just talk about reform in terms of the appellate body, but also it goes beyond to thinking about how to create a functioning a dispute settlement system that is accessible to all members by 2024. So a lot of the discussion up to now has been about um, resurrecting the appellate body or uh, creating under Article 25 uh, a sort of a foil for the appellate body until it is resurrected through the MPIA. But I think um, as a result of some recent discussions, not least the, at the WTO Public Forum, a recent panel which I was lucky enough to be on, there seems to be, uh, you know, some reappraisement or reappraisal of good offices, mediation, conciliation as either an alternative to but also uh, possibly additive to the existing uh, adjudicative uh, and arbitration options. So today promises to be a very, very um, useful discussion. Um, I see that it has been termed a brainstorming, which means that after the presentation, um, I'm hoping that we can open up uh, the discussion and get ideas from the members of this group about how um, how to flesh out these as potential alternatives or if uh, the you know the feeling in the room is that that's not really these are not really viable options to develop beyond where they are now that there'll be sort of some thinking about um, you know how we can resurrect 
the dispute settlement mechanism in a way that does become a functioning system that is accessible to all. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, our panelists. No strangers to anyone um, in this field, but very briefly, we will start uh, with a presentation. I understand it's a PowerPoint by Professor Petrus Mavroides, who uh, is at the Columbia Law, where he serves as a member of the Center on Global Governance and on a number of boards. He is a prolific writer, not least very recently, especially on issues relating to the appellate body. Um, he did a series of, of papers, I know, with Bernard Huckman on the topic, and I'm really, I think we're all very interested to hear what he may have to say about uh, these new options or these old options rendered anew under Article 5. Let me also welcome uh, Todd Friedbacher, the managing partner um, of the Geneva office of Sidley Austin which he co-founded in 2000, and he is a seasoned litigator, having represented clients in over 65 WTO disputes, and having been himself such a frequent user of the system. I think it will all be very uh, curious and interested to know what his ideas might be uh, on invigorating um, these other Article 5 ADR options. And then we will have as discussant um, following on from the, the two main speakers, uh, former Ambassador Jonathan Reed, Reed, sorry, who is currently a senior advisor with Bennett Jones, LLP in Ottawa, um, and the Albright Stonebridge Group in Washington, D.C., uh, senior associate to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, also in Washington, uh, an advisor to Lowell and Consultant in London, the U.K., most of us probably would know him um, based on his uh, August service um, as the ambassador of, Can of Canada and uh, permanent representative to the WTO from 2012 to 2017, where he played a key role in multilateral trade negotiations, including as chair of the WTO's general counsel in 2014, and importantly for our discussion, the dispute settlement body in 2013. So, of course, their bios are much longer than, um, than I have uh, presented. Uh, but for now, you have the full bios in the package of documents that were presented um, with this session. So we'll go straight into it. Um, I'll ask Professor McBroides to speak for an initial 10 minutes, followed by Todd for 10 minutes, and then followed by Jonathan for another 10 minutes. And then we will open up the floor to your brainstorming power as a group where we can take this discussion. So over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Luxan Kun, for including me in this uh, event. I have, just a sec, I have here a PowerPoint. So Dr. Luxan Kun asked me to focus on settlements and uh, WTO education, and so thus we avoid overlap with Professor Dr. Friedbacher, who will come next. And essentially, this is what uh, I want to a little bit explain the record, say what I like about settlements, and to what extent this could be a, an avenue for improving adjudication in the WTO. Now, there is no statutory definition of settlements, so I had to invent one myself. I distinguish settlements, the, the, the neighboring concept is withdrawal, but I understand settlements cases where we have a quid pro quo and withdrawal unilateral measures. In, in my book, I checked uh, all cases up to DS-595, so I'm sort 20, the last 20 numbers. And to my counting, if you accept my definition, the total number of settlements is 137, that is 23% of all disputes filed since January 1st, 1995. Now, settlements are important before we start looking into details. This is the prime objective of the DSU. It's the cardinal statutory preference. We move into withdrawal only if settlements fail, and suspension of concessions is the last resort. But clearly, the DSU prefers property over liability rules, and settlements is a property rule. 
And uh, when I was checking the data, while the overwhelming majority of settlements occurs before a report has been issued, there are settlements that occur also after when a report, after the issuance of a report. Now, does this hierarchy make sense? In my view, yes, for various, as I say here, heterogeneous reasons. First, when parties settle, they own the outcome, and uh, the likelihood of implementation is likelier. It's not a third party asking me to do something. It's something I have negotiated and I can live with. Importantly, uh, in cases where we have uncertainty of case law, settlement is the best option for risk averse agents. And in WTO, there is a lot of uh, unsettled, let's say, case law. I can give you examples if you wish later from national treatment all the way to what is a public body. Furthermore, from an administrative perspective, it makes sense to settle because assuming there is a constraint and we cannot have uh, a, an infinite amount of resources, we have fixed administrative resources, other things equal, if uh, the legal officers and the panelists work on fewer cases, the quality of the report will shoot up. And from a participant's perspective, well, you reduce litigation costs. You don't want to go through a process which on average is more or less four years. You settle bilaterally and this is it. So settlements do make sense, no matter what, whether your perspective is efficiency of the process or implementation of the outcome. Now, is there a downside? Yes, there is a downside. We can set, settle and impose negative spillovers on non-participants. So I checked uh, when I was doing my book, the, um, all settlements from DS1 to DS595, and I proposed a very simple, if not dumb altogether, rule of thumb. I divided settlements where you have notification of more or less than one page. Now, when it is more than one page settlements, in my view, almost all of them were with one, you can have a, question mark about in one case, they were WTO consistent. When it is less than one page, I cannot say that they're inconsistent, but based on the information I have, it is very difficult for me to conclude. So the overwhelming majority, because the overwhelming majority of settlements are above more than one page, I like what I see in terms of WTO practice. Now, how does the DCU help realize its objectives? I mean, how does it subsidize settlements? Well, Essentially, by guaranteeing transparency, exempted and exposed, but not in between. So, exempted, you level information asymmetries. If I am China or US or even the EU, the third power, uh, I know about export, I have about the barriers to export markets much better than St. Kitts and Nevis. So, uh, by requesting from uh, members to notify consultations to the WTO and from the WTO to the membership, many people are aware of what's going on around the world. Exposed, you avoid the, the hits on MFN. And in between, in my view, wisely, there is not uh, uh, transparency because uh, this is a way to facilitate deals. Now, this to me makes, makes sense. It's not something I would touch. And the question I ask myself is, can we do even better? Now, before I go into can we do even better, let's keep in mind first that we don't know when settlements will occur. It's like disputes. In equilibrium, we cannot say exactly when a dispute will arise because disputes can arise for both good faith reasons, contract incompletion, but also bad faith reasons, political economy. Now, how bad faith disputes arise and when they arise, the literature in uh, economics and law and economics has been struggling for years to come up with a response. There is no obvious response. By the same token, we don't know when settlements will happen. What we do know if we're Monday morning quarterbacks and we go back and we look at the record is that there were settlements were much, much more um, frequent occurrence in the first years of the WTO than they have been after 2008, especially with the return of geopolitics. So when I was looking, I did a time, very simple time series, and I looked into the first 100 cases. 
40% of all cases were settled. Ever since, less than 20%. Bush and Ryan heard in 2001 two political scientists, Canadian and American, and Reich, an Israeli lawyer, a few years later, 2018, not 2009, 118, sorry about this. They checked the data in general for cases, not only settlements, but withdrawals, same trend. Many, many more cases were settled before. Uh, disputes go all the way to the appellate body, especially after 2008. And now, is this rate satisfactory or unsatisfactory? Quite frankly, it's very difficult to say because, uh, first of all, how do we define compliance? I mean, there are many ways you can define compliance. I have a very crude uh, understanding myself. I mean, you can say, for example, on one end, you can say compliance. I don't care what is the reason for complying as long as you accept uh, uh, your WTO obligations. Fine. In this, uh, in this understanding, over 90% of disputes. I counted one by one, have been implemented. But I might comply because of WTO countermeasures or whatever, threat of countermeasures, I'm, or because I've been persuaded. I might also comply because somebody gave me a seat at the UN. Now, this is private information we never know about. So it's very difficult to say what is the way to improve the current situation. So this is my last slide and my three cents in this discussion. I can see the argument that uh, introducing neutral participants like the DG in the consultation stage could sensitize members about the WTO consistency or inconsistency of measures, but it could reduce likelihood of settlements because remember what I said before, very often non-WTO elements are used as carrots or maybe even sticks sometimes in order to induce compliance. Now, introducing formality, for example, I issue a consent award as it happens in investment arbitration. I cannot see um, any downside here. Might incite more settlements because now you have a title to say, look, this is uh, binding. We cannot go back to what we have agreed. Although, quite frankly, I know of only one case where there was a dispute post settlement. Do I like 411 DSU where you can invite, uh, anyone can raise the hand and become uh, co-complainant? Does it help settlements? I would, ex other things equal, I would expect this not to be the case when the respondent is um, a WTO member with uh, small bargaining power. But when you look at the data, the overwhelming majority of cases, on the other side, you have either the US or the EU. So it doesn't, doesn't seem to have uh, um, contributed towards less settlements, Article 411, although I can see the point in principle in case you have more uh, developing countries sitting on um, being appearing as respondents. One thing that struck me very much was um, that the again over two thirds of the set of the settled cases are G2 by G2 I mean EU US, although the EU is not the number two commercial power, but China uh, joined halfway through, and I go back to 1995, and IND industrialized the OECD members. These, these, these groups, they set, these two groups settle much, much more often than uh, developing countries or BRICS. I try to understand why I haven't come up with everything, it's something I still, I'm still thinking about. I've heard all sorts of uh, uh, different, uh, I've read all sorts of different accounts. This is something we can discuss maybe later. My last point is this. One inst legal institution that um, uh, I think could inspire uh, an amendment of the DSU so as to facilitate settlements would be specific trade concerns. We sat down with Bob Wolf, who is a political scientist from Canada a few years back, and then again and again and again with Henrik Horn, and um, uh, we checked the number of cases notified as STCs, and we have an inverted pyramid where you start with a very high number and you go up with a, just a few cases and up before panels. And I think, again, we can discuss if you wish later, just my last, last sentence, I think the identity of participants matters. Uh, consultations and settlements, they require a deliberative process. It doesn't make much sense to have trade lawyers uh, monopolizing this uh, 
type of uh, uh, endeavors. It makes sense. And this is, the, I think, in large part, the attraction of STCs to have scientists, when I discuss environmental, whatever, public health uh, uh, legislation, to have economists, to have people who understand the substance and what is behind the issue much better than lawyers do. All talents uh, are necessary, and I think this is one reason why STCs have been so successful. So that's something I would keep in mind for a future uh, amendment, if you wish, of cons Article 4 consultations. And I stop here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Petro. It's really interesting to use uh, statistics relating to settlements as a prism through which uh, to, to consider the viability of these um, ADR options um, in, in, as, as a reform um, option. So really, really interesting remarks. And I noticed the questions you raised at the end, and hopefully people will come back to you uh, to probe you and offer their own thoughts on some of the questions you posed. I think it's great to now move on to a lawyer. <laughs> Notice at the end there, again, another plug to bring more persons into the discussion besides lawyers. But we now want to hear from you, Todd, about what your perspective as a heavy litigator in this space, um, what you think uh, about ADR options as alternatives to what we have currently um, uh, by way of panels and appellate body and arbitration. Great. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, thank you to Petros for the introduction of his ideas and also to, to FMG for inviting me. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share a few ideas with you today. I will put up a single slide, which I hope you can see now, um, just to try and organize uh, into one place uh, some of the points I wanted to talk through with you today. What what I thought I'd do is put the discussion of alternative dispute resolution into the context of dispute settlement reform and some ideas that my colleagues and I have been um, thinking about uh, as, as the discussions around dispute settlement reform have ripened. Dating back to the HARA process and then accelerating with the onset of the appellate body crisis and accelerating even more now that members have committed in the MC12 outcome document to get dispute settlement rolling again. My colleagues and I at Sidley have been giving significant thought to pragmatic ways to accommodate the objectives that members have been throwing out there, floating around on how to uh, reform the dispute settlement system and get it fully functioning again. As litigators, the ideas that we're coming up with are unsurprisingly somewhat technical in nature. We look at things, these problems from a technician's perspective, but we're also mindful of the policy objectives uh, that, that have um, been put out by important constituencies and are trying to keep those in mind in formulating suggestions. And fundamentally in pursuing reform, we think that it's necessary to reconsider or reassess the balance between and amongst the key actors in the dispute settlement system. The membership, panels, the uh, appellate body, and the secretariat. And you notice that I started with the term members of those four key actors, and that's not by accident. Uh, Catherine Tai, amongst others, has spoken about the need to give members greater agency over the resolution of disputes. She's put that word agency into several talks that she's delivered um, in, in the last year. And there are two ways to interpret her use of that term agency. The first is that members should be encouraged to use ADR techniques and the tools at their disposal under the covered agreements to resolve disputes themselves rather than taking litigation to the end of the process. The second is that members should dictate the course and the outcome of litigation itself at the WTO. Now, I'll choose the first interpretation over the second, because to me, the second envisages, envisages a dispute settlement system that lacks the very qualities that, at least to me and to my colleagues at Sidley, give it its essential character, adherence to the rule of law, objectivity, and independence. So the question to put to ourselves is, how could we give members greater agency 
over the resolution of disputes. The techniques for resolving disputes using ADR have been in the DSU and 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 scattered about in others of the covered in others of the covered agreements since the beginning, and yet they are very rarely used. The question is, how can we change that? How can we change behavior? To us, it all comes down to incentives. How do we incentivize meaningful engagement in alternative dispute resolution tools that have been on the books since the beginning, but have been very rarely used? So in our view, first and foremost, incentivizing meaningful engagement in alternative dispute resolution requires integrating ADR into the regular dispute settlement process. What we want to try and do is create an environment in which parties throughout the course of a dispute get real-time feedback about the strengths and weaknesses of their positions that will help them understand the advantages of participating in ADR versus the disadvantages of continuing the dispute, litigating the, the dispute through to the bitter end. Only if the advantages and disadvantages are set out clearly for parties in the course of a dispute, live and up close, and only if the pathway back to formal binding dispute settlement and compulsory jurisdiction is direct and swift, in our view, will the parties feel incentivized to meaningfully engage in ADR. So how would we suggest that um, integrating ADR into the regular dispute process? It's fundamentally important in our view, and this goes a little bit contrary to a point Petros was making, to, to nominate a facilitator. To us, if you're going to have ADR in the context of a dispute, it does need to be facilitated because every party needs to be able, if it's going to settle, to report back to a domestic constituency or domestic constituencies that it has fought to the bitter end and had the views of an objective outside third party to corroborate any advice that it is offering those constituencies around settlement. Corroboration is incredibly important uh, in order to get domestic buy-in in our experience from a litigation perspective. And to us, the facilitator needs to be someone who is completely and utterly independent from the panel. It has to be someone who is able and willing to speak truths to the parties about the strengths and weaknesses of their positions. And it has to be somebody who is ready to and, and will engage on an ex parte basis with the parties. Evidently, neither of those things uh, can be achieved by a panel, which must remain objective and, and uh, then obviously not engage in any ex parte communication. We trigger engagement of the parties with one another and with the facilitator at several junctures throughout the life of a dispute. And on the slide, we've noted a few potential junctures, although it's a movable feast. We list consultations, although to be honest, that probably isn't a particularly opportune time. Um, when you're in consultations, you know, every party thinks that it's invincible at that point in time. Uh, they haven't been subject to the reality of the exchange of argument and evidence. They haven't been subject to difficult questions put to them by the adjudicator. They have fully drunk their own Kool-Aid. And so it hasn't proven to be the most opportune time to achieve settlement. That said, a facilitator who's willing to push the parties a little bit may be able to soften positions and potentially, if not stop the dispute and lead to settlement at that point, at least reduce the scope of the dispute. More likely, uh, we think that the opportunity for fruitful facilitated ADR will occur later in the dispute. As it matures, as the issues become joined, as argument and evidence are exchanged, and as those really, really uncomfortable questions are put to the parties at, uh, at hearings. From that point, the parties begin to see the strengths and vulnerabilities in their case, and they're able to understand what the result might be if they litigate again to the bitter end. And so hearing that from the facilitator 
uh, throughout or at these key junctures um, could be very useful in encouraging settlement. What we try to identify here are a series of circuit breakers of sorts, these moments of introspection that allow the parties to step back a little bit, to absorb the reality of the, the thrust and parry of the arguments and evidence, and to take them outside of the bubbles in which they would otherwise normally sit, to hear from the facilitator that it may actually be better to settle than to litigate to the bitter end. The result might actually end up being better for one party or the other. So um, just, to, just to close, how would we implement facilitated ADR in the dispute settle, into the dispute settlement system? Uh, we've, as I said earlier, you know, the ADR techniques and tools themselves have been on the books since the beginning. So there, it's not as though we have to record anywhere the different options or tools that members have uh, to, to pursue ADR. The biggest challenge frankly, is the voluntary nature of those tools. If the default rule continues to be that you will not use ADR unless the parties agree in the context of each and every individual dispute, it'll never happen. It hasn't to date, that won't change. So our thought is to flip the presumption. There will presumably be some sort of understanding, consensus understanding between the members to record the outcome of the DS reform uh, discussions that we're engaged in right now. Facilitated ADR integrated into the regular dispute settlement process could be incorporated into that understanding as a default rule. Members could always, or parties to a dispute could always augment that default rule. They could even opt out if they wanted to in the context of an individual dispute. But inertia being what it is, I'd much rather have the default rule be uh, integrated ADR into dispute settlement. Just a few thoughts um, for, for, uh, um, for discussion, and I'll pass it back to Janine. Thanks, Todd. Um, really interesting thoughts there. Um, and quite elaborate thinking by you and the team um, on how to integrate mediation into the pre-existing sort of construct of dispute settlement uh, using the, the normal sort of panel uh, process. So I'm sure that's going to excite a lot of <laughs> debate. Um, but let's wait to hear uh, first from Ambassador Freed, um, who is serving as discussant, I imagine, on these two not necessarily opposing, but different views on how we could use um, ADRs in the service of, of better settlement of disputes at the, at the WTO and in the context now of the ongoing spirit of reform. Ambassador, over to you. Well, as many of you know, in Canada, we're so egalitarian, none of us carry titles uh, after our service. So uh, I'm a former ambassador, not ambassador. Uh, in uh, this context. Look, uh, a discussant uh, can either be a challenger uh, or a compliment, and I think I tend towards the latter, but I'm also here to be a bit provocative uh, uh, to trigger some more discussion. So what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes just recalling some premises on which both uh, Petros and Todd uh, uh, based their remarks, and I very much welcome their reflections. I start very basically with the fact that we're constantly talking about the WTO as a member-driven organization, and that means members are the owners of the system, and they're the owners of the dispute settlement system. We call the basic Uruguay round bargain notwithstanding uh, so many of us pledging allegiance to a rules-based system, there is no and has not been any independent judiciary. No panel report, no appellate body report has any status whatsoever until and unless it's adopted by the members themselves. And that's true of the membership as a whole, but it's also particularly true of the disputants. 
the disputants have control at each and every stage of the process. They decide whether to initiate consultations, whether to request a panel, whether to ask the DG to appoint panelists, whether to seek authorization to impose countermeasures, or to request that uh, the retaliation be arbitrated, or to impose retaliation. None of that is triggered by the system, by the authorities, by some independent uh, governing body. That's the members uh, themselves. Second point about members being in control is in Article 3.7 of the DSU. The preferred outcome is not the enforcement of rights, but rather, a, and I quote, a solution mutually acceptable to the parties and consistent with the uh, covered agreements, or as Petros emphasized, the withdrawal of a violative measure with compensation or retaliation as a last result. In sum, the objective of the whole system is twofold. First, to reach a mutually acceptable solution, and second, not to enforce rights, but rather to maintain a balance of rights and obligations, a balance of concessions not to solely rule on right and wrong. And that was reflected all the way back in 47 with, uh, in the GATT-based uh, working party approach. Look, there's lots of scholarship uh, uh, on this, and I won't uh, cite chapter and verse, but <laughs> with the library background, to just take one little snippet from John Jackson, who wrote as early as 1998, that we all avoid setting up a dichotomy between politics on the one hand and the rule of law on the other. He said we should be speaking instead of a rules-oriented approach. That better accords with the reality and it better accommodates bargaining, negotiation, policy, ADR, and so on. So that's premise number one. Premise number two is that the membership as a whole has a stake in each and every dispute and has a stake in the system. Uh, on paper, at least, if you look at the design uh, uh, of the WTO and the DSU, it was to foster an agreed solution, which Petros uh, uh, highlighted, and to restore a balance of concession. And it invited the engagement of other members at every stage uh, of a dispute settlement process, even with all respect to Todd at the consultation stage. Notification is given of a request for consultations to the DSU. What happens, uh, unfortunately, is uh, a purely rote recital of a request for consultations, opposition from the requested state, and the second round is just as rote by which the consultations uh, are authorized by default uh, the second time uh, around. What was supposed to happen was other members having the opportunity to say, come on, guys, here's a dispute that shouldn't have to happen. Why don't you consider X or Y? Uh, picking up from Todd, why don't you look at the alternate means of uh, trying to reach mutual accommodation or find that balance of concessions and so on. We as members, and having chaired the DSB, I can say virtually uh, always no one uh, takes on that membership uh, responsibility. At the other end of the process, the same was supposed to be true that if you get a panel report or an appellate body ruling that's in the view of members off base, it's the members themselves that have every right to say, no, the proper interpretation is X, not Y. Or here's a particular nuance that needs to be added. And we as the owners of the system, as the ultimate authority, say that and record that for future reference. That doesn't happen either in the receipt of a, of a panel report or an appellate body report. Same thing at the implementation stage. Item one on every DSB agenda is reports on implementation. And you get, again, 
almost uh, a ritual. You can play a tape by which the party who has yet to implement says, oh, it's still before Congress. Oh, we're still de debating it. The offended party adds its criticism for the umpteenth time, nothing happened. The membership has abdicated its obligation, and I would say it's an obligation to contribute constructively on ways and means to both either implement or uh, reach uh, a settlement. Third point, let me turn to ADR because we use it as a shorthand. On the one hand, uh, narrowly, it's often used to refer to arbitration or mediation versus adjudication. But as both of the uh, uh, presenters highlighted, it actually covers a much broader field, everything from good offices to fact finding to facilitators and so on. And again, the system on paper is supposed to, and members agreed in signing these agreements are supposed to pursue all those avenues for an amicable and mutually agreeable uh, settlement. With all respect to Todd, I'm not sure you can impose that uh, on the disputing parties, but they are affirmatively to be encouraged to look at the range of options. Sometimes, as often occurs domestically in construction disputes or uh, disputes with the technical or scientific aspect, fact finding uh, and use of experts may be useful. Sometimes good offices, if the parties aren't, aren't on very good speaking terms, uh, might be the appropriate avenue. So it's not always a facilitator. Uh, it's the full range of alternate means uh, that are available. But again, the membership has uh, not fulfilled its uh, obligation to encourage and to brainstorm and to offer creatively uh, the range of uh, options uh, uh, that are available. Going back to what I said at the beginning, ultimately the disputing parties themselves are, are in con control. Um, so um, the final uh, point is really just to sum up uh, and having tried at each and every DSB meeting that I chaired, to draw out the membership and between meetings to consult quietly with those members who were presenting by rote uh, their positions rather than exploring things is to find uh, uh, a means of actively encouraging this collective ownership uh, more broadly and uh, the non-litigious approach that the system calls for by the disputing parties themselves. Final, final point uh, in response to Todd, in between the HARA process and the current consultations flowing from the stalemate in the appellate body, there was an effort led by Canada and my dear colleague Rob McDougall at the time to develop a series of practice notes, as they were called, which were a range of options that countries could voluntarily sign up for uh, without trying to amend the DSU, given the uh, 20 plus years uh, that it's been in process without uh, results. And among those practice notes options were, we agree in advance to a transparent, uh, publicly accessible hearing. We agree in advance to have those pauses or circuit breakers uh, and so on. It had some legs, uh, but uh, uh, in parallel to what we've discussed in other contexts, the notion of plurilateral versus unilateral agreement got in the way uh, and uh, it stalled, but it's still around. Uh, they are texts still worth rereading and may provide uh, an interesting uh, middle ground. So being only a discussant, I'm gonna stop there uh, in this rules-oriented discussion, uh, to borrow Jackson's phrase again, and hopefully that triggers some more thoughts and brainstorming that jean uh, wants to promote. Thank you so much, Jonathan. <laughs> I ditched the ambassador. Um, <laughs>
Um, so thank you so much for these thoughts to kind of enliven the discussion with a, a dose of reality of, uh, based on your experience. Seems to me as if all of the speakers in different ways certainly are commending uh, ADRs as some sort of options with some sort of possibility uh, for having success. But it seems still to be mired in, uh, in some kind of inactivity. And I wonder if any of the speakers have tangible solutions or suggestions of how to, how to start, uh, any of the discussions rolling in the context of the DSU reform, um, uh, in order to, to bring this to life at the WTO. But, but that's one question that I have. I want to first turn to the audience and see if by a show of hands or just abusing your mic, anyone had immediate reactions to any of the three speakers uh, that they needed an immediate sort of response to any of the, the questions posed or the, the statements made? Anyone? Okay, so, so whilst everyone is I think we have a question to Todd from uh, Peter Vandenbosch, and his question, if I'll read it out, is in his uh, contemplation and in his proposal of a, of a process where a mediator could be called in as a circuit breaker at various pro uh, uh, stages of the proceedings, uh, the question is, would the facilitator you refer to be given full access to the panel proceedings? Thank you, Genevieve, and thanks, Peter, for that question. I, in, in the approach we envisage, yes, the facilitator would have full access to the exchange of arguments and evidence. It would all, he or she would also have presumably access as an observer at any hearings. And the idea is that if you're going to be effective in knocking heads together, if I can use that colloquial phrase, and, and, and speaking truths to the parties, those truths have to be informed, and they're only going to be informed if you've studied um, the positions and understood where the strengths and weaknesses lay. Thanks, Todd. Um, I wonder if that would introduce any other layers of complexity relating to the you know, confidentiality of the proceedings. Um, I don't know if this is a fleshed out proposal that you and, and the team have come up with, or you're still at the very sort of early stages of thinking about it. But is this something that you, you might propose and put out as a white paper? Or again, well, to my question of how we jumpstart, you know, a, a positive kind of approach to figuring out how, how we can enable these ADR options. Right. I mean, for, for us, Shani, you know, we're, we're, we are giving, um, some thought, as I said at the outset, to ways in which we can revisit or reassess the balance of um, the balance between the different parties or um, actors in the dispute settlement system, members, panel, appellate, adjudicator, and the secretariat. And so one element when we're thinking about rebalancing the role of members is to think about this point around an um, agency to settle disputes themselves. Um, and, and so there are, there are the other legs of that, um, of that thinking that we're, we're building, um, into a paper that we hope to come up with sometime in the next month or so, um, on ways to revisit the, the, the roles of panels, um, the appeal and, and the secretariat as well. But, Focusing now on, on, on members and, and their agency to resolve disputes themselves, um, the, the, the idea was to build into whatever understanding comes out of the, the, uh, discussions, um, from paragraph four of the, of the, um, MC12 outcome document to, to build into that understanding something about facilitated ADR. I, I, you would, of course, have to, and in, in the course of putting that understanding down on paper about facilitated ADR have to agree that um, the confidentiality rules would not uh, restrict the ability of the facilitator to have access to submissions and, and to the hearings. Um, I don't suggest that the facilitator should have any um, insights 
into or, or, or interaction with the panel in terms of the panel's deliberations. Those should, those should remain confidential. Um, and not accessed or accessible by uh, by the facilitator her or himself. Thank you. We look forward to that uh, paper, and, and hopefully some of the thinking in this session will will further refine it. I I think we have a series of questions from Sherry Stevenson. I'm I'm hesitant to read them out instead of offering her the opportunity to unmute her mic and ask them. Uh, but Sherry, if you don't want to do that, I I can just read it out. Um, it's available to everyone. Um, okay, so it's um, I'm happy, Janice, to talk. Go about ahead, it. please. All right, thanks. In in theory, it was just um, a series of thoughts on the very same question. The because I thought all of these presentations were fascinating, and I was particularly drawn by the the research that Petros has done into. Um, the various dispute settlement cases over the past years and how they, and how many have been settled, 40%, um, out of the total, which seems very positive. But then he went on to say that the G2, the industrialized or G2 WTO members have settled much more often than the developing, uh, members and the BRICS. And that really struck me because given that we know that as countries develop over time, they're going to have more trade disputes amongst themselves. And we also know that it is a very hard process to move from the developing status further to middle income and beyond. What, what does that mean? Does that mean that, therefore, I don't know. Does it mean that fewer disputes will be resolved if we adopt an alternative dispute resolution um, approach as a default for the system? Um, does it mean that that will in turn discourage credibility of the WTO? I don't know. I'm trying to think through this. And I know, Petrus, that you said you didn't yet have an answer as to why and that there were different ideas swirling around in your head. But perhaps until we really know why, maybe this is a little bit of a dangerous road to go down. I'm not sure. I think it's an excellent positive road to explore, but I'm just saying there may be alternative or implications of an outcome of this road that we need to think about as well. Thanks. Really excellent uh, observation. And back to you, Petros, if you have a response. Uh, Petros, you're muted. Petros, you're muted. Maybe I deserve to be muted. So, <laughs> uh, um, there is, a, I said, there is a plethora of writings, especially by political scientists, and it's not recent. I mean, you, you can draw from all those guys who are writing about the democratic peace theory and so on and so on, why democratic diets don't go to war, why don't they dispute more often and so on and so forth. I was... I, I got, I, I, let me put, I have a very simple, very, I don't know if it's not a response, very simple thinking about it so far. And this is a psychology area where I still work. First, when it comes to participation in dispute settlement, which is subsumed in your question, I did a paper with uh, Hockham, Nordstrom, and Henrik a few years back. We spent, you cannot believe how much time thinking of all possible alternatives. And then we ended up saying that in our view, assuming the probability to encounter illegal trade barriers is the same across WTO members, which is a very heavy assumption, I understand. What explains best participation is uh, the share of international trade. And this, this is what data continues to show. So I'm not surprised you see on the receiving end EU and US very often. I'm a little bit surprised that China is not more often a target because China is G2 now. So, and again, there's a lot of literature discussing uh, what is, what explains the reduced percentage of China acting as respondent in WTO. Quite frankly, I haven't seen a super persuasive paper so far. When it comes to why these guys settle more than other guys, um, I'm comparing, and that's why I told you I'm still working on it. I'm comparing these rates to the rates in uh, uh, the context of TBT. 
the TBT, there are a couple of people in the TBT committee, and I should mention one because, in my view, it's one of the brightest uh, WTO Secretariat members, Laura Locks, who does a lot of work in this area, and he is a very careful researcher of the situation. Uh, in TBT, the situation is a bit different. So it's not 40% uh, due to end IND and the rest uh, almost nothing. So I'm trying to understand what is it the context that explains the difference. Now, one thing, and this is my last point, and Sherry, I'm sorry I cannot respond more than that because otherwise I would be saying things I don't believe in. One thing which is very important in my view, and this is my work with my very dear friend who is not here with us, Bernard Marco Huckman, is that we observe the importance of regime identity in WTO in recent years. There is a return of geopolitics. And as I said, settlements have taken a big hit. If you look over time, you observe fewer and fewer and fewer settlements, less than half of what it was the case before. And this, uh, coupled with uh, the point that you have more of a participation of China in as respondent now than before, because for years China was not a respondent the first years that it was joined the WTO, makes me think that maybe geopolitics is an area that we should be exploring in order to understand when settlements occur, when is it likelier to see settlements occurring. And that's all I have for you for now. I know there are other questions and, and comments in line. Let me just add a, a footnote because I think the situation is somewhat dynamic. Unfortunately, we don't have Australian Ambassador Mina with us, but uh, the most recent uh, good example of developing and developing country opting to look for uh, ADR is the Philippines and Thailand, a long simmering dispute over tobacco uh, taxes and import duties. They opted to accept the offer from Australia of good offices, and that led to an agreed uh, settlement after years of threatening to go to uh, a panel. I think part of the problem, just to reinforce my preliminary remarks, is awareness and the constructive engagement of other members to volunteer or to remind of the range of options uh, available, whether that third country is volunteering to itself perform good offices or fact-finding, or simply to point the way to the options available. Uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, someone from the Advisory Center on WTO uh, disputes regarding the least developed and uh, uh, whether some of these options are, are being explored as well. But I think we're seeing an evolution uh, as opposed to the traditional uh, frequent user points earned by developed versus developing countries. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jonathan. I think that's some of the, one of the things that was most uh, jarring about Petrus's uh, observation that it's really that 40% of the cases um, involve, you know, the G2 countries that are settled, which means that for many of the countries that are uh, marginal, very, very infrequent users of the system, what that evidence or that, that research suggests is that that might not even be a viable option, at least historically, in terms of the number of settlements we see. That might not be a viable option for them. So when we talk about greater access to the system, um, you know, that's not a positive, uh, um, you know, kind of sign. So what is a viable out, 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 outlook or outcome for them if it's not going to be settlement based on these statistics? So I'm, I'm really curious to hear from that perspective, and also you mentioned the recent uh, good offices uh, illustration um, of, of the settlement. And if anyone here has experience or knows more about that process, how well it works, what you know, what challenges there were, we'd really love to hear. But we have two two more persons in line. Um, I'll go with you first, John, and then Daniel. Thank you very much. That's uh, I I think we've had. This is a very interesting discussion, very high quality, and we've had three excellent initial presentations, and I think really they were they were complementary. Um, I'm I'm intrigued by uh, Todd Friedbacher's suggestion of a facilitator, 
And I'm very mindful of what John Freed had to say about this is a system that's owned by the by the membership. And uh, and yet the members have not been very good, and not only in this area, one might say, at, at accepting their responsibilities for making the system work. So I sort of, I don't disagree with anything that anybody says, but I, I, I wonder if having a facilitator, and, and I take it and from what Todd said, that this would be, in effect, a mandatory part of a new system. So there would, in each case, be a facilitator. People could call on the facilitator or not, as the case may be, but the facilitator would actually be present during the various steps, as Todd was describing. And so this individual would really be in everybody's face. It would be very hard to to totally ignore him. And if, if he were to contact the parties to per, to give some views or thoughts, um, uh, they, they 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 would see this as a regular part of the system. Now, I, I'm intrigued also by this Australian example that John cited of Australia as a as a as a as a, as a mediator. Um, that's been extremely useful, but that's actually quite a promising quite a promising development. But I have um, so I have two two questions. One is, would the facilitator be as I've just described it, sort of a mandatory part of a revised process? And, and secondly, um, would, I, I assume this facilitator would be remunerated in some fashion because otherwise he or she wouldn't be very interested in spending that amount of time, um, in, 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 in this process. And, um, and if so, would this be, uh, a payment that would come from, from the parties to the dispute or from the, the, uh, from the secretariat as part of the WTO uh, members' budget. Um, I, I would say that I, I, I come back again. I think from from the evidence that has been brought out previously, I think it's clear that some kind of reform is really necessary because an ADR may offer some promising openings because the process really isn't working. When you have disputes that take four years millions of dollars in legal fees uh, of, of a complexity that is very hard for any ordinary mortal to understand. Um, I, I, I think that it, it's, it's, this may be part of the explanation why some of the smaller countries have found it difficult to venture into the field of alternative settlements, whereas the, the major parties who have large banks of lawyers and so on at their disposal uh, are getting a lot more advice about whether or not it would make sense for them to settle. And I would see a facilitator approach as being a relatively low cost, frankly, uh, method of trying to help improve the functioning of the system. Sorry to speak so long. I'll stop there. That's, that's okay, John. Really great points. Uh, and, and just to ask you, do, do you agree that this facilitator option should be uh, refined or confined to, um, you know, being built into the existing process? Or do you see legs for having it operate outside of the, the, the panel existing process? No, I, I think I think it should. I mean, just off the top of my head, and I hadn't really thought about it before, but from my own experience, I, I, I would think it would only work if it was built right into the system, because okay. that would make it it would make it more normal, and it would make it much easier for the parties to access. Okay. But I, it would obviously it would obviously mean, have to be structured in a way that that didn't make parties uncomfortable. Okay, let me just allow, allow, allow Daniel to make his point and then we'll go back uh, to Jonathan and then Todd to answer that question that, that, that John raised. Go ahead, Daniel. Thanks so much. And I not so much want to make a point, but ask a couple of questions here. And then thank you uh, for your moderation and also to Petros, Todd, and Jonathan so far. Um, but my, I, I guess, um, at least from the perspective of kind of looking at this from, from the outside, um, the, the timing of ADR and the timing of efforts to try to resolve a case 
uh, drives everything from at least our practice perspective and, it, and that the WTO, the DSU is structured exactly the opposite to the way that you would need to, uh, uh, you know, resolve a dispute before turning up the political pressure. And, and by that, I mean, in order to get to uh, ADR under the current DSU, you have to file for consultations, or at least that's how the process uh, goes. Uh, you have to have a dispute first. So you have to take a public position that uh, you go on the record or that you're in a dispute, and then you try and, 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 and settle. So I think any any kind of the, the question is w- whether any of the panelists and speakers ha- have a have a view that that might be I guess not taken out of the system as, as a whole, but taken taken out of the dispute uh, system, the kind of DSU. There has to be a dispute uh, where countries are actually taking positions against each other before you start to try to resolve the, the thing. And I would kind of point to the SPS and TBT uh, committees and efforts to try to resolve disputes with experts and with a more low-key and non-legal, non-disputing uh, approach before you start taking public positions that are difficult to back away from. One question for Jonathan is, you know, we, we all know, you know, it, ambassadors and we have several on the call and it's spoken. I mean, it's one thing for you to say, you know, you know, that members should take ownership in the system when we push them. But, you know, I mean, why haven't your own countries done that when you've been serving and and kind of how realistic is it to expect members to take ownership of an issue and rise up against, you know, a, a ruling and, and kind of correct that, that, that record, I guess, just seems unrealistic to, to, to expect that to, to happen, at least under the current circumstances. And so what do we need to do in order to get to that level of ownership, uh, of, of the, the system? We can actually do those things. And, and I was actually like to prompt others who are listening to react to Jonathan's kind of rules oriented um, approach to, to, to the system. I thought that was super interesting. And I agree that the WTO itself is not a market organization, but a market oriented organization. And I think rules based should be rules oriented, but it, it, does everybody agree with that? Or is that just, uh, you know, where do you put that? That we're, we're not kind of talking about rule of law and, and kind of, you know, strict justice, but, but kind of, Settling, settling for something other than the implementation of, of your strict obligations and, uh, and reaching a balance versus kind of winning a case. Thanks All right. For that. Uh, we have a lot of really interesting elements there. Jonathan, I'm going to let you go first. And, um, because we only have 20 minutes left, I ask you to keep it tight and short and then we'll go to Todd and then Jim. Yeah. No, um, uh, very quick uh, responses uh, to the last two uh, comments. Number one, the reason I hesitate about uh, uh, presumption or mandatory facilitator is you end up, unless it's further elaborated to be more flexible, you end up funneling into, in effect, a good offices role. Let me give you an alternate example. It was in an FTA context not WTO. Canada and the United States had disputes about lumber standards. Uh, The U.S. had one standard, Canada had another. We argued that they both, even though different, have the same performance result, which is the purpose of the standard. We couldn't agree, but we did agree to refer the question to two forestry labs, one in each country, for a purely scientific objective assessment of whether the standards met the performance requirements of each country. We didn't need a facilitator to do that, but that's a fact finding that's quite alternate to a facilitated uh, good offices. If the countries are talking, they don't need a third party to talk. They need to be reminded of the full range of things. Regarding Daniel's question, look, some of us and some of our countries did actively, repeatedly, in successive sessions, talk about either implementation, jurisprudence, or so on. One of the problems with both what's evolved from the consultation stage and the manner in which the DSB is conducted is it's delegated to the legal officer in each of the missions. 
Very seldom do you see an ambassador <laughs> participate. Very seldom do you bring a policy perspective to a company, the legal perspective. And the same can be said at the consultation stage, because as originally intended, it was to give notice, nothing more, uh, in order to facilitate seeking a mutually agreed solution. As Todd's observations reflect, it's turned into pre-trial discovery uh, uh, and not more than that. So we've become hostage to the rules-based as opposed to rule-oriented approach. We've given too much to the lawyers and have, uh, again, abdicated that policy dimension that belongs at the center of maintaining the balance of concessions. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, over, to, uh, over to you, Todd, and I wonder if in responding, you can also take up the question or comment made by Daniel about uh, these ADR options only being viable once a dispute has kind of been articulated or bubbled up as being something that is already happening and whether or not there's a legal basis for taking any of these options outside of the formal um, you know, context of a dispute that has already been uh, consulted on. I, I find that an interesting interpretation of, of the rule. But in addition to all the other questions, if you can tackle that, and I think there's a question to you in the chat, which yes. is from, which I think you've seen, which is, um, how would mandatory facilitators be selected, appointed? What would the requirements for selection be? This is really taking up some steam. So if you can flesh out some of sure. the ideas. Well. Sure. Happy to do so. So first, just on Daniel's point, I mean, I, I agree entirely with Daniel that the the requirement under Article 5 of the DSU, or the, the background assumption is that you're already in a dispute. Um, Article 5, Paragraph 1 says good offices, conciliation and mediation are procedures that are undertaken voluntarily if the parties to the dispute so agree. So the very opening clause is we're in a dispute. And so the question is, what do you do once you're in that dispute? Now, there are many variations on a theme um, around ADR tools in different of the covered agreements. There are provisions on ADR in the SPS agreement, in the TBT agreement, in the government procurement agreement, and, and elsewhere. Um, and some of those foresee some form of ADR. Um, short of an actual dispute, but the principal one in Article 5 uh, does foresee a dispute first being triggered um, before you uh, engage in good offices, conciliation, or mediation. So that's just that first point. Then to John Weeks's question about the way in which, at least in our early thinking about this, um, the process would work. So Again, my assumption is that once we get to the end of the paragraph four discussions around DS reform, there will be some form of understanding. I'm not calling it a DSU amendment because I, we, we know how fraught that is. There will be some form of understanding, recording a consensus by the membership around reforms to the dispute settlement process. What I'm suggesting is that one element of that understanding might be around the use of facilitated uh, facilitated ADR as the default rule um, in dispute settlement. Now, saying that it's the default rule only means that it is there presumptively. Within the context of any given dispute, one or more of the parties might decide, I don't want to have a facilitator involved here. And in that case, the facilitator wouldn't be involved. It is It would be hard to overcome otherwise the uh, express rule in the DSU that participation in uh, in Article 5, at least good, in good offices, conciliation and mediation are voluntary. So again, in an understanding reflecting the consensus of the members around DSU reform, we would have uh, a default rule for facilitated ADR in the context of every dispute, but there would be an opt out um, in, in any given dispute. Um, why facilitate? I mean, to, to, to respond to um, some points that Jonathan was making, which I appreciate, uh, you know, why should we have facilitated ADR? 
In other words, a third party kind of helping the members get to yes. And why should it be in the context of a dispute? I think that it's, <laughs> well, again, what we want to do is change behavior. Um, the, the old saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and, 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 and assuming uh, that you're going to get to a different result. We have had Article 5 on the books since the very beginning. It has very, very rarely uh, been used. Um, and so we have to try, if we want the members to have greater agency, again, I'm using that word that Catherine Tai has, I think, in a very considered way employed over and over again in recent months. If we're going to give members greater agency to resolve disputes themselves, we have to help them figure out a way to use tools that have been on the books forever but have not been used. And so that's why I think there needs to be some form of facilitation to uh, face to force the parties to face the uncomfortable truths about the strengths and weaknesses of their positions so that hopefully they can um, come to a settlement rather than litigating to the bitter end. Now, I love the questions from uh, John Weeks and um, Peter Vandenbosch about the nitty gritty, because that shows that that there's there's um, folks who are at least interested in and, and, and hopefully buying in, at least at a preliminary level, to these ideas. I'd much rather talk about uh, those details than, um, than uh, you know, conceptual opposition uh, to the notion of facilitated ADR itself. Now, but I will, I will ask you to be brief on the details. Yes. I'm sure we so, have well, it's easy to be brief on the details because the answer is, I don't know. It's up to the members. Um, I agree entirely that, you know, you have to assume that whoever is going to do this, if they're going to do it properly and they're going to invest in what it takes to be useful as a facilitator, they're going to have to be paid. So um, we're going to have to think about who pays them. Um, but I'm all ears uh, for the members to engage on who should who should uh, pay them, how they should be appointed. Um, I think we have to, again, assume that they have to be very you know, deeply qualified and willing to engage in order to do it properly. But beyond that, up to all of uh, up to all of the members to decide on um, uh, the ins and outs. Thanks so much, Todd. I, I know we have two more hands and we have 10 more minutes. Again, if we need to extend a little bit further, um, um, I'll ask you, Shang Kun, who I'm going to ask you to ask your question next to, to make a decision on whether we go an extra five or 10 minutes. So over to you and then Gabrielle. Okay, thank you, Jean-Yves. No problem. I will be uh, happy to take over if you have to leave and uh, members, uh, friends want to discuss. No, uh, because today we have the presence of quite some uh, ambassadors from uh, developing countries, less advanced developed countries, especially some LDCs. So, so I, I was trying to think about uh, very excellent presentations and the new ways of looking at future potential WTO reform on dispute settlement. Uh, I was wondering how we look at this uh, more from a developmental perspective, because we we know that figures, uh, Petros and others, have done a lot that uh, less advanced developed countries are not substantial users of this system uh, mechanism, uh, and but there are cases sporadically coming up and uh, from time to time. We also said a lot that uh, abiding dispute settlement, including the appellate body, would help the kind of less powerful countries vis-a-vis -vis more powerful countries uh, on the equal footing issue. Uh, this is uh, uh, not only a kind of, there are a few things to think about uh, capacity. How could they, because of the capacity constraint, uh, other than the dispute uh, settlement uh, kind of mechanism itself, but also uh, allocate a lot of resources to a kind of uh, facilitate uh, a good office, mediate, or some other informal uh, kind of uh, process we are going, trying to develop, develop there. But also that, let's say, use the example of Todd about a facilitator, uh, that even with the facilitator, so it's more, like, more or less still kind of bilateral vis-a-vis -vis probably a more powerful country. How could we make sure this process will help them to overcome the kind of uh, unequal footing, especially when Petros in his presentation said that from time to time, the non two elements could be introduced in this kind of bilateral negotiation for the resolution. 
So, so, and of course, the last point is that whatever we are going to discuss here, if we want to bring them formally into the future, they have to reform our dispute settlement and appellate body. We need their say, their yes, uh, 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 to, to get this done. So that's just a, a thought here. Probably any uh, speaker could maybe help clarify. That would be very helpful. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for putting that really front and center of the discussion. And I'd ask each of the speakers to, to sort of think about their proposal, bearing in mind the underrepresentation of many of these countries in current dispute settlement. And thinking sort of even about your tangible solution, one of the previous speakers said that, uh, you know, these disputes are currently very lengthy, they're complex. Is a facilitator going to even add uh, to the lens, to the complication, is it going to kind of make any of the things that have been, uh, you know, problematic in the past? Is it going to kind of clear the way for greater participation for, from some of these countries? I would like each of the speakers in the, maybe in the last um, or in the next round of discussions to really squarely think about uh, how we are enabling in this two settlement countries uh, that do not currently feature. Gabrielle, um, anything on that specific question, or do you have a more general Yes, question? I have something on that question. But before, I want to say that I think what we have to think about is incentives for uh, those ADR. And I was thinking of an old process dealing with textile disputes where under the old, um, when it was still enforced, the textile agreement, the rule was that if a dispute goes to the TMB, that was considered multilateral consultations with textile expert, then the parties, if there was no settlement, were allowed to skip above consultations and go straight to panel in order to avoid delays. And we know how speed and delays are important. So I don't have the time now, but I've thought of a series of routes that can be used. If you have raised the issue and STCs in a committee, for instance, you can go straight to another process. On the issue of developing country, I don't want to sound negative, but my experience with the long banana dispute was that this uh, sort of mediation was held for ACP countries because formerly it was between EU and Latinos. ACPs were kept outside. And I, it made me realize that all these mediations being extremely confidential, not based on law. The deal on banana was a 70 percent a tariff on bananas within FTAs between EU and Latinos. This is illegal. How can other countries learn from these settlements? Mediation and divorce law that I've uh, done a bit when I was young also leads sometimes to unfair result, unfair pension. So, yes, I'm not sure that mediation will help access uh, to developing countries at all because of this transparency issue. And it makes things to some extent more complicated because it can run parallel to adjudication. Thank you. We don't hear you. No, thank you so much, Gabrielle, for these insights. A really, really great way to think, you know, in the reverse about how mediation can result possibly to less than transfer and less than wholesome outcomes for developing countries. Our speakers, we have four more minutes. If we want to go longer, we can. But I did want to have uh, give the, the speakers and discussants an opportunity uh, to respond to anything they've heard, and in particular, uh, this question of enhancing and enabling developing countries' participation in the system. Uh, so unless I see another hand or a question, Maybe I'll start with you, Todd, and then uh, Petros, and then to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jenny. Very quickly, and I, I'm afraid I do have a hard stop at um, at half past, so I will have to jump. Um, but you know, just to uh, to the point about um, developing country access and whether at least the proposal that I offered about facilitated ADR would um, encourage or facilitate, uh, to use, an, uh, use that word again, um, participation by developing countries. You know, the whole idea of it is to try and have these circuit breakers, these off ramps to cut short the litigation process and everything that involves, including cost, 
including complexity. And so that is, that is the entire idea of it. Hopefully, if we have incentivized the right behavior, which is use of the facilitated ADR to reach settlement rather than litigating to the better, rather than litigating to the bitter end, we will make um, uh, the process cheaper and we will make it um, more accessible uh, for for everyone, including developing countries. So that that's that's certainly our sense of it. Um, I, I don't see th there is obviously a cost to having facilitators involved. Members will have to consider who bears that cost if it's the parties individually, which would, of course, um, undermine the accessibility issue, or if it's the membership more generally, the institution more generally, which would facilitate um, use and access to um, dispute settlement and, and ADR by developing country members. Any, any fair thought about what Gabrielle brought in there, which is there's also what the potential, especially if it's a parallel process, to bring in non-WTO concerns that could actually work contrary to the interests of some developing countries. Any concern there? Well, I mean, you know, the way we envision it is that it would be in the context of a particular dispute, only the part, at least by default, only the parties to that dispute would be invited um, to the facilitated ADR. And so they would presumably by they would presumably manage to a degree the the scope of the discussions, the scope and scale of the discussions by um, reducing the voices in the room, which is fair enough. Again, as Daniel noted, and I agree with that entirely, we're talking about a process that by definition under Article 5 of the DSU only triggers when there is a dispute between parties. And so the parties to the dispute are the ones who are dictating uh, the way in which um, facilitated ADR would occur. Thank you. So, so I don't much. I don't worry as much about losing control of it in in that context. Thanks so much, Todd. Uh, Petros, any final thoughts uh, by you or further research maybe that you you'll be doing on this topic as it's exciting so much interest. You'll have to unmute. Oh, Petros, yeah. you have to unmute your mic. Sorry about this. I go by what I observe, and what I observe is that the best, uh, the most successful um, scheme to resolve disputes is uh, specific trade concerns. Uh, to me, this is uh, this is uh, very promising. And uh, as I said before, the difference between specific trade concerns and any other process is that. In the realm of STCs, the identity of participants is totally different from the identity of participants in a normal dispute. Now, when it comes, I'm not saying, as I said in my paper, I, I can see the argument in having someone facilitate, but quite frankly, Article 5 has been there since 1995 and has never been used. So I don't think that this is, this would be a game changer. To me, the game changer is introduce STCs everywhere and allow people with different expertise to participate and negotiate those deals. Uh, Petros, I wonder if that paper um, circulated, is there an opportunity for, for you to just give us, um, you know, uh, the, the citation for the paper? I don't know if it was circulated. Which, which paper? The, the paper you just, you're just mentioning or reference. Oh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, it is, it is in my book and there are, 20 papers concerning specific trade concerns now from different people. The one person who spent a lot of time thinking about it is Bob Wolf. If you go to his web page, uh, Bob has a few papers on specific trade concerns and what are the distinctive features of STCs, which, again, it's difficult to prove those things. It's very difficult to prove why STCs have been so successful, but it's interesting to see what distinguishes STCs from normal consultations. And in my view, the most important feature is the identity of participants. When you discuss whether uh, inciting uh, a particular behavior violates Article 11, everybody and his or her dog have an opinion. But when we discuss to what extent the particular hormone is or is not health impairing, well, then adults stay in the room and they discuss the only world language, which is science. Now, where do I see uh, 
the most appropriate form for scientists to speak, I see it in STCs, not in the context of a facilitator. And that's why I'm a big fan of STCs. Yeah, just Thank one you. word uh, to that. FMG will organize a session on this uh, uh, later this month. So invitations have been sent out already. So be mindful. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. But in New York, it has to be a good time. So if, if it is like now, it's perfect. But Exactly. Well, the final word goes to you, uh, Jonathan, in two minutes. Well, I'm, uh, I'm privileged to have, it's not the last word other than chronologically, I won't be definitive, but three quick observations. Number one, on developing country participation, uh, John Weeks didn't volunteer, but he's been a long-standing member of the board of the Advisory Center on WTO Law. They've uh, long considered uh, uh, developing country participation. That's deserving of its own discussion, uh, it seems to me. Uh, second, the example of specific trade concerns actually reminds us, uh, Petros, that ultimately we need to put dispute settlement in the context of the overall functioning of the system, because each committee and subcommittee and working group is supposed to have peer review the system of notifications, which is broken, uh, both because of its complexity and because members, again, uh, don't take responsibility for discussion, permits that kind of discussion that you have in SPS in other committees as well. And the more you have this pre-consultation exchange of views with other members' participation, the more you're into a dispute avoidance early warning system and the less litigious the system becomes. Final, final world word, just to go back, and Todd's not with us anymore, it seems to me that we shouldn't give up on the plurilateral lead by example possibility. To have another look at the dispute settlement practice notes, uh, the, the opt-in uh, option for uh, member countries who want to do so to take on some of these additional uh, refinements, such as we agree in advance to use a facilitator if that's the wish. I've expressed my hesitation about that. But we need not wait for the never-ending DSU review uh, to make these reforms that don't require uh, the formal amendment of the DSU. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was a great place to end. Um, I think you all very much brainstormed. We have some old ideas, some new ideas. I think what's coming out definitely as if there were any uh, time to you know, rethink some of these procedures, now is the time. It makes us feel more enabled, more in control of putting forward solutions um, than I think we have for the past two or three years. And I think this is the time to really put out your papers, put out your thoughts and have these kinds of discussions to generate the thinking that's needed to propel the reform process forward. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to FMG and Shankun and Leliana and all of those who uh, put forward such a wonderful, wonderful cast of panelists, speakers and discussants, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next session. And Shankun, maybe you can advertise where the next session is. Over yeah, we... Yeah, thank you, uh, John. Uh, it's, uh, first, of all, just one quick word on, on this discussion is excellent. I agree very much. And uh, uh, of course, we also find out that there are a lot to discuss. Uh, I mean, the, even this subject, we need more time to think about and with probably more experience gaining about idea or this soft power. And also, it will be an issue whether we can invite John, uh, George Mina or others who have been participating in that kind of process uh, not against their confidentiality rule, but to see how they could help uh, uh, put more kind of fruitful thoughts into this process. We also have other aspects of this whole kind of review or reform process of MPIA. There are more and more cases lining up now. Uh, and of course, on the whole dispute and appellate body reform process, we know that there the are discussions going on in Geneva or elsewhere, informal, formal. We need to see, follow that very closely soon uh, also. So I think those are all worth uh, being uh, thinking about uh, in the future. Uh, for FMG, we have uh, uh, a few sessions uh, lining up all the way to November. So as I said, that we have one session on 21st, if I'm not mistaken. 
on using the MS12 uh, SPS agree, uh, agreement on SPS committee and how that would uh, kind of uh, give us a lens into the uh, role of the regular committee meetings as the ST uh, specific trade concerns that Petros has said to resolve the issues before any formal process. We have another one on uh, investment f facilitation. We're also discussing uh, about services, e-commerce, and others. So, so uh, we will keep you posted and uh, invitations will be sent to you all from time to time. So with that, I thank you all, and especially to the panel and pan uh, the, the Jean uh, Yves uh, for the great uh, discussion. And we look forward to you uh, your participation next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.